I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I wanted to go to college. Um, I finished, I was in high school in the late 60s, graduated in 71, and um, there was still some resistance about women going to college. Uh, my father's family um, had not been very big on college for, for the girls, for my female cousins. Um, some had gone to uh, like two-year associate degrees. Uh, one had gone on to college, but she was sort of the rebel. Um, so it was, my father was a little bit discouraged to invest money into a girl. Um, my mom was, the, was adamant the other way. She had gone to uh, three and a half years of college while she lived in Oklahoma, and she was very much a supporter. And my dad wasn't, um, he wasn't against it. It just wasn't, it just wasn't something he had never gone, had any opportunity to do any higher education. And he'd done training schools, but um, it was still a little bit of a stretch. But um, I managed to get a scholarship to a state university in Indiana, and um, it, it wasn't on my radar. It just, you know, things just sort of develop um, over time. And there was not a lot of encouragement in my high school for girls to seek out scholarships. I, I did it on my own. And so once I had a, a scholarship to go to college, then my parents were more willing to help me with room and board and go away to school. We had um, an extension of Indiana University in the South Bend area, so I could have gone to college and lived at home, which was sort of what I thought I was gonna do, but all of a sudden I had an opportunity to go away, and, and the state college was Indiana State, and it was about 250 miles away, so it was like really going away to school. Um, and it was a small, it's one of the smaller state colleges in Indiana. It's a teacher's college primarily, but also um, lots of other things. and. Um, and it was there that I met the pre-law advisor. Um, his name was William Matthews, and he was a professor. And from the very first time I heard him speak about law school and about what it meant to be a lawyer, I was really, um, I mean, it really captured my imagination because I wanted to do something different. I didn't wanna, I mean, I love teachers and my family are all teachers, but I just didn't wanna be traditional. I didn't wanna do what people expected me to do. I wanted to do something I wanted to be my best self, and I didn't know what that was. Um, and Mr. Matthews really opened the door for me. He really, I ended up working as a student assistant, and he um, mentored me, and he worked with lots of other students on their, on their law school dreams and how to apply to law school. And this was all paper. This was way before computers. And so you actually had to order things through the mail, you know. and. Uh, and he, and he really encouraged me. He was, he was my, um, it, it was just fortuitous for me because I never had met anyone like him. I never met a lawyer or a judge in my life. And then when I was thinking about law school, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to, again, I just sort of always wanted to strike out a little bit on my own. And we talked about Oklahoma because I had some family that lived here and um, he knew that I liked a college setting and he said his, his best advice was pick somewhere to go to law school where you probably will stay because you will meet people in law school that you'll be colleagues with for the rest of your career. You'll learn more about the community, about the government, about politics, about everything a, a, around you. And all of that will help you a great deal as you get into the practice of law. And he was so right. And so I came to Oklahoma. A lot of my relatives here were surprised um, but I came with every intention of making this my place for my career, and it's worked out remarkably well. Um, my heritage is Mexican, and so my dad is 100% Mexican, and so I am half Mexican, and so um, that is my heritage and very proud of it. Um, and so my dad has always, and my mom, but my dad, um, he is Hispanic, my mom is not, but he has always been a very big role model for me um, throughout my life. I really never realized um, until I got older that it was maybe a little different or maybe people perceived it to be a little bit different because my, like I said, my father, Fred Mendoza, is 100% Hispanic and then my mom um, is not um, any of Hispanic origin and so, but growing up I had such a loving family and loving family from my dad's side and my mom's side that I truly, within my family, never really realized that that was unique um, and and so it's very interesting because even you know I look back at it now but 
my mom would kind of tease that we would go to different events, um, or, you know, maybe even the grocery store, or go and, and run errands, and they would always go ask about us and ask, you know, if she was like the nanny or something like that, or, you know, didn't really identify her as my mother because she had, you know, blonde hair and green eyes. Um, so it's very interesting. And I never, I really truly never noticed that it was maybe something unusual, unique, or, or different growing up. Not till I was much older that I, I realized the uniqueness of the situation. Um, in early 2018, I had a calling to uh, run for district judge. And so it's something I never thought I would ever run for an elected office. I really um, didn't think that that was something I would do, but I just one day had a calling there was a judge that was retiring and I thought you know I really I really want to do more um, in this community and I feel like you know with my experience that I'm, I'm meant to do more and so it was just um, an opportunity to run and um, so I, I campaigned and the community was behind me and it was just a, a wonderful time of um, working in the community and building relationships and, and running for office that year. And it's just amazing all the support that came behind me. And so um, I was elected as district judge in November of 2018 to begin my term January of 2019. And so it was such an honor and just, you know, really the, just the greatest dream that I could ever achieve um, being elected by my community. It was a countywide seat and so all of Oklahoma County could vote and so it was just I was really humbled to have been elected um, and so I began in January of 2019. I was sworn in and then assigned a criminal docket which I now have and then this last election cycle I ran unopposed and so was sworn in this January for my second uh, four-year term. So it, it's quite an honor to to um, serve my community and be able to give back and, and it's it's really been my ultimate dream I mean I still I um, you know every day I come to work I still can't believe that I get to do this as my job because it's something I really love I'm passionate about the law I'm passionate about people I think it's very important that whoever comes in my courtroom is treated with respect and kindness no matter their charge everyone is human and I think everyone deserves respect if I want respect then how can I expect that if I'm not respecting everybody that's coming before me so it's very important to me um, as a judge so I was born in Vietnam I um my parents were married and had me, and shortly after they had me, my dad had to flee Vietnam from the communist government. So I was probably nine or 10 months at that time, so I never met my father until I came to the United States. I was almost 11 at that time when we reunited. Um, so mom and I came from Vietnam and moved to the United States to reunite with my dad. Um, and at that time, we were able to, well, I was able to meet him for the first time. So I didn't speak English and came here, um, was able to go to school and had all these wonderful opportunities that I had in Oklahoma. I'm very grateful for it. So is part of your background a reason that you pursued law? Yes. It was my dream to become, to be able to become a judge um, because the law, as you can probably tell by my family's experience, is that it was whatever the government wanted it to be. There was no fairness, there was no process. If they want to take your land, they'll take your land. And so the rule of law is extremely important to me and the process of getting there is extremely important because Without those um, protections and without the preservation of those principles, you don't have a democracy. So it is extremely important to me to be able to uphold the rule of law and to be able to um, provide a fair process for everyone who steps foot in the courthouse. Tell us. Um, why you decided to pursue a career in law? Because of some of the injustices I saw growing up in my neighborhood, which was primarily African-American. I was middle class, African-American, um, and I, I saw the inequity, and it touched my family in a special way. 
mom and dad divorced when I was 13 and we were plunged into poverty, which is a new experience for us. Um, and so we learned resiliency. Um, I learned um, how the system sometimes taxes poor folk more than it does others in a number of ways. You know, if you can't pay your electric bill, you gotta put a deposit down. Well, if you had money, you'd pay it on time or you'd pay it close to time. And just a lot of things. Um, and so it made an impression on me and I decided uh, when I was an undergrad, I wanted to be, do political science. I love the, the, the science of politics and the, the expansion and contraction of it and how it shaped America. So I always studied that um, and, and didn't want to go to law school because you got to go to undergrad, then you got to go three more years of law school. But then I figured out if I'm going to be a professor in poli sci, I got to do the same thing. And a law degree is a powerful degree. You know, it is powerful in so many ways in terms of expanding your mind, your access to information, knowing how to find information. And so I decided if I'm going to have to go three more years to be a professor, I'm going to go ahead and get a law degree. And um, it was the only thing that I've ever studied nonstop at and didn't mind doing. I was on fire for learning about how the law intersects with society, the role of lawyers in society and those kind of things. Um, and it, it's, it hit a spark in me um, about what you could do with it, use correctly, um, and how important it had been to the development of this country. So being part of, of a minority group mm -hmm. in, in the state of Oklahoma, and also a woman, mm -hmm. have you ever faced any bias or unconscious bias? I still do. I still do. Um, they're, they're called microaggressions. Um, and in law school, um, yes, from the professors from time to time. Most of the professors were wonderful, helpful, and welcoming. There were some who were not, who thought that we were there on some kind of affirmative action program and, and shouldn't have been there to start out with. Um, even though my, my credentials were impeccable, uh, we still dealt with that. Um, classmates, not so much. Some, some classmates um, wouldn't study with us because they thought our intelligence level was lesser than theirs. Um, and I really, I will acknowledge it, but I don't let it slow me down or stop me. And that's their problem if that's what they think. And I'm gonna do, I learned to study to master the material. Um, not so much to get on law review, I wasn't worried about that because I always felt like I was gonna be in public service. But it was to master the material because only by mastering the material can you manipulate it and change it and make it metamorphosize for, for justice, okay? That's where you see where it puts together, where the holes are, how to move it around. Because law is one of those things that justice looks different depending on what the facts are and the circumstances of the cases that come in front of you. So justice is not a one-size-fits-all kind of proposition. And what I learned from law school was you learn the rule and then they teach you the exceptions to the rule. And the exceptions are what allows justice to be expandable and contractible but fit every situation. Okay. And so that was the fascinating part about it for me, was, was learning that and then learning how to use it in a way that made it fit justice for the particular situation and facts in front of me. And so that's, to me, the art of the practice of law. So how did it look like for you uh, as a female lawyer wanting to go into that field? When I was in law school, um, we had about 225 in our class, and we had maybe 20 women. And um, there were not a lot of women that were um, in the community, in the legal practice in the community. Um, when I was admitted to the Bar Association in 1978, um, the women <laughs> percentage of women was like 3% in the Oklahoma Bar Association. Um, by the 1980s, it, had, it was rising a little bit. Um, and so there weren't a lot of women around in Oklahoma. There were no appellate judges. There were no women federal judges. Um, this was before even Sandra Day O'Connor was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. So um, it was very traditional. There was, there were, on, on some of the bigger benches, like Oklahoma and Tulsa, there, there might be a woman or two that, were, that, that had made it that at that point, but um, 
we had one law professor who was female at OU. Um, so I really didn't have any real, too much any role model, but men were role models. I mean, I, you know, along the way, I had very many uh, friends who were very supportive of my career um, that were men. And, um, you know, you, you have support where, because you try, because you, they know that you are a quality person and that you are trustworthy and that you work hard and all of those things. And so over time, you gain the trust of people. And I, and I uh, went into the practice of law. I didn't have a real easy time getting a job. Um, one of the law firms that interviewed me uh, told me that they would not be able to hire me because I was female, because their clients wouldn't accept the fact that they had a female lawyer. But finally, a firm did. I was the first woman they ever hired. Um, but they gave me a chance. You know, they opened the door for me. And, um, and there was some resistance in some of the courthouses. Some of the judges were openly disrespectful, um, not just to me, but other women also, the few that were around. There were not very many women in the courthouse. And, um, but, you know, you have to, <laughs> You have to find a way to go forward, and um, and and I wasn't I, I wasn't discouraged easily, um, and and that's been a, a big asset I think is it, it's hard to it's hard to face resistance and not become discouraged, but if you do, I don't care who you are, whether you're female or male or or anything in any race or or ethnic background, if if you don't. If you can't take some adversity along the way, you're not going to be successful. And I, um, you know, I always felt like I, in some ways, I had nothing to lose. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep showing up. You know, you, you, you feel discouraged and you kind of regroup. You go home. You, you know, whatever. And then you come back the next day and you try harder and you learn from all of those experiences, good and bad. And that was, that was, I think that's really the key, is you take whatever opportunity, whatever opportunity you're given and you make the most of it. And I was fortunate that I had enough opportunity um, along the way and as one door closed, another door opened.